Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to talk about an article um, based on AQR, the quantitative finance firm. It talks a little bit about the issues they're having with machine learning and finance. Um, I'm just going to put a note here because I believe there was, I don't know, three months ago or so, um, there was actually an article on how uh, AQR had hired one of like these leading experts from Princeton in machine learning. Um, they brought them in, they worked there for six months, paid them very well, and then that person quit. Um, so we're gonna kind of think about that a little bit as we dive into more of my opinion and perspectives here. But let's just kind of review the article a little bit. I'll put a link below so you can read it as well. But the article talks you know, about kind of the strides in machine learning. It talks about you know, a machine can beat a human playing chess, which is pretty impressive. Um, later it talks about you know, like classification problems using machine learning. So it can classify cats and dogs you know, as two separate things, and a computer does a very good job at this. But then the article goes into talking about a lot of the issues with machine learning in finance. And I think one of the key takeaways, something that I definitely agreed with in the way it's done, is that the way markets are structured is it's supposed to be a competitive environment. Um, it's how capitalism works. You know, it's a free market environment where people are buying and selling different assets at different prices. Um, and essentially, these supply and demand and the drive behind these different assets over time is going to adjust the prices um, accordingly. So if there's going to be some mispricing, people are going to see this, they're going to buy it until they continually make profits. As soon as they buy and they keep buying and buying, right, um, the demand's increasing, um, it'll actually drive the price of that asset up. And then that opportunity that, there, that was there will actually disappear. So this is just trading 101. Um, but I think this is one of the key problems in time series in general for finance. Um, and specifically with machine learning is the fact that there's not a lot of data, which they also mentioned in the article, but then also that the way these dynamics are working with the fact that you don't have a lot of data, it, there's not a lot to train on. And so I don't think in a lot of cases, neural networks, for example, other machine learning um, algorithms, we'll call them, other methodologies in general, will actually be able to trade very profitably. I am positive and I am sure there is going to be some way to use it um, to improve profits and trading, finance and banking. It's going to have great impact. And even this article talks about there are other areas in finance um, where the problem itself might be complicated, but the structure doesn't really change too much. Like The problem is fairly stable, but there's lots of little rules. And I think this goes back to the chess example here. Right, playing chess is difficult. There's a lot of different moves, there's a lot of different you know, configurations and the way that all the pieces move and putting it all together and the strategy. But the thing is there's rules for how chess works. There are very strict and rigid rules on how it works, but there are a lot, if not an infinite number of moves and possible positions you can take and you know, different strategies and applying those. But the thing is, is that it's very structured. Markets have somewhat of a rule-based system, but that rule-based system is somewhat flexible and it changes and it's dynamic and there's a lot of information from millions and millions of participants that all come into this all at once that are more or less impacting and affecting how things work dynamically and strategically and so i don't think a lot of machine learning methods currently at least the way we're applying them the way we're doing research with them um, are able to really capture this and make this a profitable venture over a long period of time so I'm going to follow this up with the fact that I know there's going to be someone in the comments saying, oh, Dimitri, I used a neural network or I used a gradient boosting and I created some model and I bought something and the price went up and therefore I made a profit and it's making money. Okay, I'm talking about the big boys here. I'm talking about the institutions, the big multi-million dollar funds. I'm not talking about somebody who just randomly bought something, took a gamble, it went up, they attributed that to being smart and they moved on with you know, their 50 to $100. We're talking multi-million dollar and not many cases, you know, billion dollar funds here. We're talking about being able to have strategies that last for years. So you might come up with a strategy like using a neural network, fine tuning it, setting it up. And of course you're gonna be changing it because markets are constantly changing, right? But having that same structural framework and being able to continually make profits both in boom times and in bust times so for a lot of you, we've been in a boom time for so long, if you literally buy anything, you've made money even without considering risk or strategy or anything else. But just to kind of like wrap up this picture in general and kind of talk about finance and everything, 
I think one of the big hurdles here is merging the different realms together. So merging the people that are in the data science realm, the machine learning realm, and I'm talking about more or less the leading experts in the field. I'm not talking about those with just a degree. I'm talking like very, very deep experts and people that do this for a living, you know, for many, many years, not newer people in general, but you need these people that they have a deep understanding and then trying to relate this to the finance side uh, I think there's a huge disconnect, and I think this might be why, going back to you know AQR, AQR why um, the guy they hired ended up quitting. A, it's really hard to take someone with no experience, no expert knowledge or anything, and they have this magical fairyland view that like it's going to fix everything. And then on the other side, right, being the expert is trying to explain to them like it's not magical, it's just simple mathematics, it's applied in a new method but we could use this to hopefully extract new information, new patterns, new trends, um, new data from the market and be able to use that in a better methodology to help you with your investment strategies, your banking strategies, you know, finance in general. But I think you have these two camps where it's like it's math and it's simplified and I understand things and yes, it's complex, but we need to understand this in some detail and we need to go about this very scientifically. And then I think on the finance side, you have so many business people involved and even those in like quantitative finance in general, right? So a lot of us are guilty of the same issue here. We think like, oh, it's just magically gonna fix everything or we're just gonna apply this. And I found this code online, I ran data through it. Stock prices went up, it went up. But again, you have to find things that are strategically, I guess, intellectually put together in a theoretical way that people will understand and can make profits long-term, okay? It's not simply about I put money in and it went up, so therefore it's a good method. It's about looking at risk-adjusted returns. It's about looking at the theory behind it. Um, the article also points out, which I thought was quite well, um, explaining this to investors can be difficult. And if people are gonna put money into these funds, so again, if you're playing with the big boys here, right, and you wanna invest like a real champion, you need to have a lot of money backing you um, to make things work. And to do that, you need to be able to explain that um, to your investors, You know how things are gonna function and why they're gonna function and how you're gonna go about making money. And so to kind of wrap this up here, I do want to point out some of the positives here, some of the strives and kind of the achievements that have been done in finance with machine learning methods. Um, you know, definitely with time series, time series in itself is just a challenge no matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you're doing, you know, statistics, it doesn't matter if you're applying um, recurrent neural networks. So that kind of framework. So LSTMs, for example, would fall in that, which again is time series for neural networks. Um, it's really hard to work with this in the fact that we don't have a lot of data. Um, we're trying to grasp insight on limited data. We're trying to make decisions. And then a lot of firms now are spending a lot of time trying to gather other sources of data to pull in to help back this. But in general, time series is just a challenge. Okay, It's just simple as that. Um, other areas of finance that don't depend so heavily on time series or they have massive amounts of data so for example, credit card portfolios, any credit product in general is gonna have a huge database of data. Even if you put that into a short time period, you're gonna have millions of records within you know, a year, two, three years. So it's a lot easier to build models because you have enough data to do testing on. But just to point these out, there are banks that are using decision trees. They've been used for a long time. So this is nothing new. I'm not sure why everyone's getting extra excited about machine learning in this sense, because decision trees, while are super simple, they have been used quite frequently with a variety of different banks um, over so much time. But again, it's not on the investing side, so it doesn't get as much attention and news and excitement from everybody. Um, the other area is credit in general. So gradient boosting, XG boost, you know, all that stuff. A lot of people are using R, uh, H2O AI is another kind of framework that uses R and Python. Uh, but again, right, they're having strides in kind of this area, they're making impacts. Um, there is one bank who is really into data science has been in there for some time um, and they've been using uh, gradient boosting for quite a while doing credit modeling. So it does have implications, it does have impacts, uh, but there are areas that are, I think, more suited for it where there are other areas that it might be a bit more challenging to get there to figure out how to apply it. And I think as industry practitioners, uh, we need to step back sometimes and realize not every tool can be applied to every situation. So while it seems awesome to use neural networks, it might not be the best method. I have seen it applied to different types of credit models. So neural networks here I'm talking about. Um, 
and it does okay. It does outperform traditional logistic for like scorecard development. But at the same time, the amount of impact, the amount of improvement is negligible. And so because of that, we can't really justify using a model that's more challenging to explain, especially to regulators, for example, um, than we're actually gonna be able to do with a logistic model, which is quite simple to explain and makes a lot of sense. So those are just kind of my two cents on it. I think the future is bright. I think we have a lot of exploration to do. I know there's a book on it, which I'll put a link below as well, um, where they talk about it in more depth and detail. I'm not sure how good quality the book is in general from a quantitative analytics perspective and not a business perspective. Um, but in general, I think we have a lot to work on. I think we have a lot of things to move towards. Um, I think there needs to be the misconception broken that it's a magical tool that's gonna fix everything. Um, I think a lot of banks are just running at it like crazy and throwing all these resources at it. I think it's a huge waste of money and time uh, because we should be just hiring experts, bringing in a handful of people that are quite bright and brilliant in doing this, having them analyze our problems or different situations we have in banking and perhaps these methods aren't going to improve anything we're doing, but these tools might be able to solve, you know, different problems we have, but we just haven't modeled in the past due to other challenges. So I think this could add a lot of value to banking and finance and investing in general. But again, trying to figure out where it's gonna add the value is gonna be the challenge. Um, and again, bringing in that academic rigor, not just applying things blindly in R and Python like a lot of banks are doing and a lot of investment firms have been doing and then claiming great results. Um, I just don't see that being a good strategy. More or less, we need to bring in the theory of both data science and finance and banking and putting it all together to come up with a solid model uh, framework that we can actually use to move forward. So anyways, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time. <music>